Happy Friday, everyone. What is up? Welcome back to Dirt to Dust. It's the Friday mailbag. We got some questions. It's Friday. 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 <laughs> it's the mailbag. We're going to answer some questions. Um, get that nice direct interaction with everybody out there in the Facebooks and the Instagrams and all that. Um, Caleb, welcome back. Um, really, I got to see the episode. I don't normally watch myself a lot, but it was a good episode that we put out this week, I think. I think that was... Uh, I think it was a, I think like it was a great a episode. I think we covered some uh, pretty cool topics, and I think it's a question that I mean I know we get asked quite a bit, but uh, I think we we definitely covered it in depth. Uh, if you haven't seen that episode, definitely go check it out. It's only about an hour long. It's good for a morning drive, afternoon drive, lunch yeah, break. Um, uh, Brittany even watched. I told her that we mentioned her in the podcast, and she's like, "Okay, I've got to watch this thing now." And uh, she watched the whole thing. She said it was great. So uh, well, there you now go. it's time for the mailbag. Let's get a little interactive here with it. Let's, uh, let's jump right let's in. Let's get after it. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right, welcome back to the Dirt to Dust Mailbag presented by Outlaw Off-Road. Doug Langford here, your host, along back again with Mr. Caleb Forbes. Caleb, I'll say about some questions. It is the mailbag, so open up the bag, pull out the mail. Let's get after it. It is Friday mailbag time. All right, so uh, we'll jump right right into this. Uh, The very first question um, is from a local Charlotte Jeep club uh, called Charlotte Jeep Club. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> um, so this comes from uh, a gentleman named Ryan W. Um, he said, I really want to axle swap my TJ. I don't know if I need Dana 60s. Uh, I'm looking at a JK or JL 44. Does anyone know the difference in which is better? So he's got a TJ? He's got a TJ. So the JK Dana 44 swap on a TJ is actually very common. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's a massive oh, yeah, yeah. upgrade to the TJ axles. But now companies are coming out with the JL uh, Rubicon axle to fit on a TJ the same way. Um, so he's just looking for the differences um, between the two, which one's stronger, which route should be. Um, between JK and JL, that's what he's looking at putting in. in the TJ. Mm-hmm. Did he say a tire Correct. size? What, did he say 35s? What did he say? He did not say a tire size, but typically anyone that's axle swapping a TJ is usually looking at 37s. Or yeah, or generally. I mean, TJs, you had to get up. You had to get them up pretty good to even get 35s on them. And those axles were not were not mm-hmm. amazing. So, um, I mean, obviously, the JL's a better axle. I mean, that's the third generation of the Advantech Dana axle. Um, colloquially known as the Dana 44, even though it's not, that's probably... Um, that's, that's more information, but, um, I mean, the jail is definitely stronger. The ring gear, the pinion, it's all different sizes made to be a little bit stronger. Um, everything on there was just made to be a little stronger from the two wall thickness. Uh, I mean, there's granted now here we are in 2024 and there's 15 and a half different Dana 44s that go in the jail and JT, you know, there's one for the day for the right. Rubicon. There's one for the, for the, what nah, it's just so messed up. There's one that comes with a walker. There's one that doesn't come with a walker. Um, but if you're going to do it, yeah. Okay. hundred percent. Right. We've done, even back in the day, we did a lot of those JK Rubicon swaps on, on LJs. You have several customers out there still on it. It was a pretty common swap. Um, but I would say if you can find a set of JLs, go with that just because the axle is stronger. It's also a little bit wider. Um, just know what you're getting because mm-hmm. in a JL, um, we're not talking about JT cause that's not going to swap in. That's a totally different bracketry setup on the back, but in the JL, um, the non Rubicon is an inch and a half. So three quarters of an inch on each corner, narrower, still wider mm-hmm. than the JK, 
Still wider than the JK, sure. for sure, um, but not as wide as the Rubicon. So if you're gonna do the swap and you're gonna spend the money, um, obviously it's a whole lot cheaper than going with like you know a new set of Curry 60s or Dynatrack or whatever. Um, but make right. sure that you're gonna do the Rubicon if you go JL, just because of the width. That's gonna give you um, steering sweep. You know, is gonna be better. You're gonna have better tire clearance, better um, uh, backspacing availability on wheels and such. And honestly, a wider axle on a TJ just looks cooler. So if you can get Rubicon axles and it's in your budget to do so, absolutely. If it's not in the budget to do it, totally fine to get JK. It's going to be cheaper. Um, and like you said, there's tons of kits out there. But yeah, I was on I was on Artex website actually this morning looking at some stuff for another build and saw that exact kit you were talking about. Um, and they had it on yep. their own page. I wasn't even looking at that. It just came up. Um, when I when I put in JL and there was like the JL to LJ, JL to TJ swap, you just weld the stuff mm -hmm. right on it. It's it's becoming yeah, it's right. becoming a, a very common thing to do now. And plus, with like upgrades in technology compared to you know, if you have the very last TJ or LJ that rolled off the line, I mean that's two thousand six. Yeah. We're, we're twenty talking years ago, almost twenty years ago. Uh, that's an eighteen year old Jeep, and um, yeah, just the, the technology that we have, the ring gear sizes, the strength of the gears, all those things are just so much more improved than what originally came on the TJ. Now, I do think if uh, if you're going as far as cutting brackets off, you could probably score a set of gladiator axles a little bit cheaper. And if it's if you're still welding things to it, the geometry might change a little bit. You might have to take some new measurements. But I feel like that could that work, could. too. Um, and I do think I've seen gladiator Rubicon axles actually a little bit cheaper than JL for some reason. Um, but I think because the stock mounts yeah. are limited to a like, gladiator, right. uh, it's less right. swappable in its yep. stock form. Yep. Uh, but yeah, if you're cutting off brackets, man, like, I mean, I, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the JL44. And under a TJLJ, I think you could easily run 37, 38, maybe even a 40. On if you build it up right. I mean, we've sure. shown, hell, we've yeah. shown you can run 40s on those. Plus, if you get a wider axle and you're not pushing the tire limit, you you could go with a little bit less lift on that TJ or LJ absolutely. and keep that absolutely. center of gravity a little absolutely. bit lower because you've got those axles pushed out that extra you know, three quarters of an inch or on the, over an inch on each corner versus JK axles. You're like when an inch yeah. and a quarter, right? inch and an inch to an inch and a quarter on yeah. Rubicon JL yeah. versus JK. Um, and JK, it didn't matter. The JK was a 44, was a 44, was a 44. They were all the exact same right. sport, right. Sahara, Rubicon, it didn't matter. Whereas with the JL, yeah. it matters yeah. a whole lot. So um, yeah, if it's, in the, if it's in the budget to do the JL, absolutely do the JL. Um, yeah. Yeah. So do your research, figure out which 44 it is, uh, and then yeah. send it because that's going to be cool. And then post pictures yeah, so absolutely. I can see it because I love a good TJ. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it could be a cool build uh, on a budget. I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, next. Next. Um, this comes from the Gladiators Only Club. Um, and this one's a little more generic, which kind of. I liked because it's a little open-ended for us to, to kind of dive into and take a minute to answer this. Um, generically, he just said, what's, what's my tire size limit for X axle? Like what's my tire size limit for sport axles? What's my tire size limit for Rubicon? And then what's my tire size if I go, you know, big Curry 60, 70s, Dynatrack, East Coast gear, you know, whatever, big boy axles. Um, and I think you've actually tried a, a number of those oh, combinations yeah. and broken a number of yeah. things on those combinations. So I think you have yeah. the experience to know what is your tire size limit for those things. So, I mean, and this was in a gladiator group. So this is kind of, this is kind of JLJT and in general, anything right. I say about JLJT, if you drop it by like one tire size, when we're talking about stock capability, um, that's mm -hmm. generally going to be applicable to a JK. So, you know, in general, if I say, oh, okay. stock axle can handle blank if you build it right, you know, in JL, that number's 40, and I'll kind of say why here in a second. But in a JK, I kind of say 37, maybe 38, but mm -hmm. it goes back to that first question where there's just, there's a lot of strength differences. Um, and I'll right. preface with anything, anytime we're talking about bigger tires on stock axles, that go above one to two sizes above stock, we're talking, I'm assuming that you're intelligent and that you're going to trust, you're going to properly gear it, you're going to do C's, you're going to, you know, see gussets on the front, you're going to trust it in the front, trust mm -hmm. in the rear, and you're going to do like at least like a chromoly axle shaft 
or like an RCV so that you're going to build those axles properly to handle this kind of um, extra, yeah. extra spinning oh, mass of tire yeah. and wheel because, you know, not only are the tires bigger, they weigh more. The wheels are wider than factory. The wheels weigh more than factory. So, you know, you got to account for all that stuff. So assuming all of that, um, yeah, I've, I've tested JL and JT stock axles all the way up to 40s. Um, and yeah. honestly, I mean, we did a video on this several years back. Um, so this isn't anything new to the JL, JT world. I did it on JL. I've done it on a JT. Um, you know, then the JL eventually got axle swap, but the JT didn't. The JT, I sold it, what, a month ago now? It was on 40s for yeah. half a season. Now, I didn't wheel that one, but I would have. Um, but I did have it on 38s with I a mean, Hemi. So, and, yeah, and I saw plenty of burnouts, even I, even with the 40s. I saw a couple of burnouts that on too. that. So, I mean, you stressed it out for yeah, sure. Yeah, there's videos of that. So, um, I think 40 is the number, um, and, and we've proven that time and time again. The only thing that I really did, the, the couple of times that I did bad things, um, I snapped an axle shaft in Moab, but it was literally in uh, Devil's Hot Tub, and I made like mm -hmm. I didn't back then. I had the V six. I, I just didn't have the whoop how for it. Like it would pop up and it would get up, right. and the front tires would kind of come up, but I just didn't have the spinning power to get the back tires mm -hmm. up on that vertical. Um, and then like on the ninth or tenth try, I was like, all right, I'm just going to give her all she's got, and I snapped a rear axle shaft. So that was like I gave it hell. And it finally snapped. The other time I broke an axle shaft um, was actually right there. That's the one right there. That is the 300M <laughs> that I snapped. I snapped that on uh, Trail 15 at Windrock. Um, Ooh, yeah, we were, we were kind of coming up the trail. And, and if you know Trail 15 at Windrock, it's very short. And so I came up the rock, came through the, the, the whale's back, the V-notch, did all that stuff and was climbing kind of a weird line and got up to the left exit and went too far left and just gave it all the beans all the beans that, that three six could put out and then when it came down um is when it actually i actually heard it snap so we had to we had to kind of mm -hmm. we luckily that was the end of the trail and my front was up but um one time was a driver rear yeah. one time was a passenger rear but that was the only real time. And then the only other thing other than an axle shaft is I kind of, I jacked up a pinion bearing one time, but it was at S'more. Mm -hmm. And it was, so Brandon, who kind of owns S'more, if you know him, if you've ever wheeled with him, the guy's a badass. And I was up there in an event. I was up there with Gerald, actually, from uh, from Huntsville. And Brandon okay. kind of told us about this stupid line that only buggies were on and us being us. We were like, yeah, hell yeah, we're going to do it. <laughs> hell yeah, brother. <laughs> With a freaking V8. He's got, he's got, that thing is built. He's on, I think he was on the Mickey Thompson Pro X's at the time. And I'm here on my stock axes yeah. on 40s. I'm like, hell yeah, we're going to go. We're going to send it. And I absolutely <laughs> sent it up this buggy line. And Gerald made it. Uh, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely did not <laughs> yeah. but i did drive it out of there it was fine i knew there was a little bit of pinion damage in there but so i was absolutely getting it every time i damaged the sock axle so i think if you put it a stock jo yeah. you can go 40s you can do 37 38 easy 40s is a little bit pushing it but i think for the average wheeler um 40s on that is, is going to be okay if you're not trying to if you're not trying now to that's that's on a rubicon axle though we're yeah. not going to put 40s on no. a 30, on the 37s axis. i think um you know because you okay. actually in the jl you have two different rears you have the uh, m220 mm -hmm. and which is, it, which is yep. kind of the dana 44 and you have the m200 which is basically the dana 35 um so yeah if you're not having those rubicon axes you got that m200 um i would probably i would probably say 37s not 40s yeah but same with principle that. just different tire size only because yep. of the size of the axle yep Right, absolutely. And then obviously once you get built axles, big boy axles, you know. the sky's the limit yeah, based you on what your build specs are. Well, you want. I, let me caveat um, that. If you're doing 60s, <laughs> go up a tire size from everything I said. So if you're doing 60s, I right. think 40s, you're totally comfortable. 42s, you're starting mm -hmm. to push it a little bit. Because, you know, there's a whole Instagram page. They're not real one-ton axles. They're not. They're just not. Um, but if you get into 70s, 80s, Fab 9s, Fab 10s, all that kind of stuff, yeah, do, do whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that also goes for my junkyard guys. 
similar to me, you know, uh, Ford Dana yeah, 60 like front, 60. 05 plus, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And then, you know, 14 bolt Sterling rear, that is a full float rear end. Mm -hmm. So you're fine. Um, yeah, send absolutely. it. <laughs> All right. It looks like we got time for one more question. Looks like right. this one comes from the JL owners group. Um, and I think you have experience with uh, a couple of these variations as well. So I'm looking at upgrading protection to protect my noggin. Um, what is the difference between the stock JL cage and how strong it is versus a bolt-in sport cage or a very expensive full cage? So I think, so cage, okay. I think the factory cage, and I could be wrong. Um, th this would probably be a question for Scott. I think those factory cages are rated for one rollover, maybe two. Um, there's a limit on how much they're tested to. They don't have to do as much. Um, they're only built to do certain things. Now, that said, the JL cage specifically, that hardened steel, that stuff is legit. Like, you're trying to drill through that. That crap? is legit. That, damn. <laughs> I haven't, but I've I've seen it, and I know just from looking at it, the JL cage is significantly is stronger than a JK oh, yeah, or any other cage. Now, so, something up a mountain, maybe not. So, I do know that those are not as strong because of the things that they have to do with them. Right? They can't. You can't just put a tube, mm -hmm. tube, two inch tube DOM um, roll cage. It's not going to look as good. You're not going to be able to. Hook, it's not going to be as easy to hook up your sound bars and your door. There's a lot of things. Which mm -hmm. a sport cage like Rock Hard Four by Four makes one of these. That's a add-on to the factory cage so there's all kinds of braces you can do one between the a and the b you can do a top one across you can do one from the c there's all kinds you can do the one that comes across the dashboard in the front so there's all there's all kinds of pieces and parts to doing a sport cage in its various forms but the the sport right. cage is made to basically just strengthen the factory mm -hmm. cage it's a lot cheaper to do it that way but it is it's not quite as strong as like what we have in a race car it's not a full-on cage um, but it is significantly going to beef up the factory cage. And then you go to full cage, and there's really two ways of looking at that, which you're talking about like a gen ride or a moto build or a rock solid fat, one of those that you can just get where you kind of take out the mm -hmm. interior, you know, you follow the instructions, you kind of bolt it into where, you know, and then you got a cage. Right. Uh, kind of like what Carnage was for Huntsville. Um, even another step up. That's even another step up. That's even higher. Um, that's going to be even stronger um than a sport cage because you're removing right. you're completely mm -hmm. removing the factory cage and now you're replacing it with um an aftermarket cage and a few of the brands out there even have it to where they've got right. tabs a, with them that you can still though. mount it is you know commitment. your sound bar and stuff so the cost obviously goes up significantly those are anywhere from 60 to 100 hours on what a cage would cost you to do depending on which one and how you're going to do it and all that and i know that's a wide range but it is what it is um, versus a sport cage where you know you buy the parts and it's a couple hours and it's installed so um i think um and then you know the one of uh the one above that would just be the full-on drill through the body all the way to the cage of a race car which is a little bit different but nobody's going to do that so um yeah there are definitely improvements in um how how strong they are uh but there's also uh marked differences in uh how expensive they are for sure yeah so between the stock jail cage the sport cage and the the full cage i um the jail cage is pretty strong i would definitely say so most people i would definitely recommend the sport cage for it's bolt in it's only a couple hours and if you're ready for the full commitment of a full cage um just know that it does come with a commitment level, but if you're ready for that and you're you're ready to pony up the 60 to 100 hours worth of labor, um, absolutely go for it. Uh, I think that's going to be a badass JL, and I can't wait to see that one either. Um, but so hopefully that answers that question. Um, most people are going to be going for the sport cage in the so. JL, I so. personally. Um, I think that wraps it up for today, though. I think that's all the questions I had on my list, and just to kind of keep this at a reasonable time frame to, to be quick. Uh, but we will have more questions next week for, for sure. sure. Uh, so, yeah, everybody, appreciate you guys coming out, spending a little time. Um, make sure to check out the other episodes, the other mailbags, and we will always be posting one full kind of long-form podcast every week where we go over a topic. Um, I know we got an interview coming up, a couple interviews coming up. Um, we got a really cool topic for next week as well, which may be a little different than – well, we'll see. We'll, be, we'll just let that be a surprise. And then, of course, we'll hit the mailbag next week. So send in those questions. Hit us up on Facebook, Instagram. We do peruse the groups from now. Uh, those, those are some great sources for questions. They're just great. So 
Um, oh, yeah, be, make sure you're uh, liking, subscribing, commenting, all that good stuff. But uh, that's it for this week. I'm going to head out of here. I'm going to go enjoy my weekend. Caleb, you do the same. We'll see everybody next we'll week on Dirt to Dust. You've been, been listening, listening to Dirt to Dust. Presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.